So how are we going to recognize when an individual has impaired glucose regulation? Well, we're first gonna talk about a personal or family medical history, re remembering those things that might put a patient at risk, getting a history of what medications they're taking. Do they have any central obesity? Central obesity means around the abdomen, which definitely puts people at a higher risk for problems with uh, uh, blood glucose control. Do they have a family or personal history of diabetes? hypertension, cardiovascular disease, or cancers all can increase a risk. Or maybe have maybe even been the, the high blood sugar could have been, even been the cause of the hypertension and the cardiovascular disease that went unchecked. And then you really just wanna do a full um, head to toe evaluation of the patient, looking for some of those signs and symptoms that we talked about earlier when it comes to hypo or hyperglycemia. Now, in terms of anthropometric measurements, those are things that we can uh, measure on a patient, body mass index, the uh, increase in weight and body mass index, obesity, morbid obesity, those all put patients at higher risk for having problems with glucose regulation, as well as the waist to hip ratio. So if the, the larger the waist is compared to the hips, again, it, it indicates that central obesity, the abdominal obesity that puts patients at increased risk for problems with glucose control. And then you can also look for evidence of peripheral vascular disease as prolonged chronic high blood sugars damages the linings of the vascular system, causing narrowing of the vascular um, um, arteries and veins, which can lead to peripheral vascular disease. Periphery meaning in the ends, like in the legs and the hands and the feet. Um, central meaning more into the middle of the body. Take a look on Giddens, page 136. There's a nice table here that talks about the signs and symptoms associated with hypo and hyperglycemia. This is extremely crucial that this is a table that you memorize. You need to recognize when a patient is hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic so that it cues you into those things and you can take action. Because remember, some of these issues are either gonna cause long-term chronic problems or it's a medical emergency, like a hypoglycemic emergency, where we need to intervene quickly or the patient can die. So signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, are going to be altered mental status, reduced cognition, tremors, sweating, being weak, being hungry, having a headache, being irritable, and seizing. And really, the ones of those symptoms you're going to see most often is that they're sweaty, um, and that they're altered, they're not quite with it as much, um, and they're just kind of weak and maybe even falling asleep. Those are the types of symptoms you're gonna see with hypoglycemia. Hy hypoglycemia. And then on the other end, it's those polys, polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. So they're hungry and they're urinating a lot and they're drinking a lot, they're thirsty, they're hungry and they're urinating a lot are those main signs you're gonna see with hyperglycemia. You may also notice a fruity odor to the breath. Um, you may order, notice some kind of heavier breathing. And over time, if this is chronic, you may see things like poor wound healing because again, it's a lack of circulation related to high blood sugars. And we need good circulation to have good tissue integrity, right? Uh, and weight loss, all of these things are, the ones on the bottom of this list are more the long-term effects of hyperglycemia. And the ones on the top are kind of the shorter term effects. The polys are the things you're gonna see most commonly with hyperglycemia. So write those down, polydipsia, polyphagia, um, polyuria, urinating a lot, very thirsty and very hungry. And if you prefer an infographic, here's one for you. You can pause right here and take a look at this for yourself. Now, in terms of diagnostic tests, there are some things that we can do quickly and other things that we do over time. So the blood glucose test, that finger stick, finger stick test right at the bedside is something we can do quickly. It's easily, it's, it's minor invasive, and we can have a result within two minutes. It's a really nice test, especially if you're worried about, you know, um, needing to give a patient a medication right away, or if you're worried that they're hypoglycemic, you can get an answer very quickly. The antibody testing is going to confirm type 1 diabetes because, again, that's an autoimmune thing where the body's um, really attacking its own pancreas. And so you can have antibodies to confirm if it's type 1 diabetes. 
a lipid analysis, because again, um, prolonged chronic uh, hyperglycemia, you're going to see an elevation in lipids, cholesterol, renal function tests, because the kidneys can suffer um, from chronic hyperglycemia. And a C-reactive protein is a nonspecific indicator of inflammation in the body, specifically chronic inflammation, which we know is devastating and has devastating effects to the body. So there's definitely some things we can do as nurses and collaboratively to help patients with um, optimizing glucose regulation. So let's talk about those now. Now it's no surprise that in terms of prevention, it's all about diet, exercise, and weight control. Uh, making sure they maintain a healthy weight and eating a, a well-balanced diet and maintaining physical activity um, are all going to help with glucose regulation. Did you know exercise actually helps to move glucose into the cells, out of the bloodstream and into the cells? It's really a, a neat way to help control blood sugar. So these are three things that are modifiable risks that patients can do to prevent from having blood glucose uh, irregulate, dysregulation problems. Now, in terms of screening, we're talking about two times of screening, one kind to, uh, to identify new onset diabetes early and one kind to identify complications that could arise in patients who are already diabetic. So for uh, screening for patients who do not have diabetes, we're gonna be looking at adults with risk factors and making sure we're screening them with just some basic blood glucose screenings to make sure that their blood glucose levels are normal. And also pregnant women have a risk for getting um, gestational diabetes diabetes, a diabetes specific to pregnancy that often goes away after pregnancy is over. And so all pregnant women are recommended to do the oral glucose tolerance test about halfway through their pregnancy where they drink this incredibly sickeningly sweet um, soda, basically, and then they get their blood glucose levels checked um, to make sure that they're normal and that they're able to tolerate a glucose bolus essentially um, and that they don't show signs that they um, are becoming diabetic. Now, in the second half of this is talking about screenings for people who are already diabetic to identify any complications that could arise. So a hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that gives us not just a snapshot in time. So a blood glucose test at the bedside is gonna tell us what their blood sugar is right now. But a hemoglobin A1C gives us kind of a long picture of kind of how a patient's blood glucose level control has been over the last, say, three months. Um, so that one test really gives us an understanding of how they're doing over time. And then certainly we're going to be watching their lipids, their cholesterol levels, and their renal function because uh, kidney, func kidney disease can happen as a result of chronic diabetes, as well as uh, high cholesterol. And then we're going to need to be watching their feet because sometimes they develop peripheral neuropathy where they literally can't feel their feet very well. So they may not recognize if they have any kind of wounds or injuries festering there. We need to do good eye exams because they can develop a retinopathy where they lose, start losing vision. And then also their dental hygiene is very important as we're talking about glucose. And this is because things like gingivitis can be really hard on people who are already having um, problems with their vascular system and glucose. We need to maintain good oral hygiene. Now, in terms of collaborative interventions, we can talk about education for self-management. Most of diabetic stuff is really managed at home by the patient. So the better education we can do, the uh, the better off the patient will be in terms of education and adherence. In fact, there are diabetes educators as nurses, that's their entire job is just to educate diabetic patients on how they can better take care of themselves at home. Uh, we need to work on monitoring and managing their blood sugars and whether that means diet, exercise, lifestyle, or medications talking about nutritional changes in their diet that they can make. And then again, those medications, those pharmacologic agents, both oral hypoglycemic agents, things that they can take pills that lower blood sugar levels or insulin that's going to help open those keys. The insulin's the keys to the cells, help open up cells so the, insulin, the blood glucose goes out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it can be used for energy. And then statin agents, because diabetic patients are at more risk for having high cholesterol. 
And then certainly just glucose control in general. We know that there's the chronic effects of long-term sustained hyperglycemia have really devastating effects on many organs of the body. And hypoglycemia left unchecked can lead to death. And so we really need to work on having good glucose control for these patients. Now, in terms of pre-class work for the uh, medications, I just want you to know that there's oral and there's insulin. Um, and so one example of an oral hyperglycemic agent, um, something that's going to reduce blood sugars, it's gonna be used for type two diabetics. And this is gonna be, an, metformin is an example of that. Metformin is going to reduce blood sugar levels on our type two diabetic patients and their um, tablets that so they can take once or twice a day. Also, there's a number of different types of insulin. Uh, there's a table in your Giddens text that lists these. And when we're talking about insulin, there's three kinds. There's rapid acting, things that act really quickly, but they don't last very long. There's intermediate acting, which take a little bit longer to start working, but last a little bit longer. And then there's slow or long acting that just kind of keep a baseline level for a long period of time. And so patients may be on one or more type of insulin and if you can see here on this screen that we're looking at three different things that you'll need to know about insulin. You need to know when does it onset? In other words, once you inject that either through the IV or subcutaneously, when's it gonna start to first work? And so the onset varies here on these three kinds. The peak is when is it at the peak level? When's it working at its highest? Again, that varies. And then what's the duration? How long does that dose work for? And so you'll see those rapid actings um, work very quickly. There's a quick onset, a quick peak, but it doesn't last very long. The intermediate are kind of an in-between and then those slow glargine ones, the long acting really uh, have a little bit longer of an onset and really never peak. They just kind of stay at a base level. So your patients may be on one or more types of insulin. We're gonna be working on uh, learning these more in depth in class as well together. There are a number of interrelated concepts as it comes to glucose regulation. Remember that glucose is the energy our cells need for life itself. And so managing the glucose, managing uh, chronic problems like diabetes are gonna have effects on adherence and family dynamics and culture, nutrition and mobility. All of these things play into either the fact that we're having good glucose regulation or on how we manage that poor glucose regulation and the imp impact that that has on lifestyle. There are a number of featured exemplars um, in your text. For this class, we're really just starting to get an introduction to diabetes and that's what we'll be focusing on for this class. That's gonna wrap it up here for our glucose regulation lecture and I'll see you soon.